Welcome back to Something in the Wilderness, where I discuss the music of Andrew McMahon from throughout his career, song by song. My name's Steve, and today will be a first for this podcast. I'll be discussing a song again, but this time, I have some help. I've been looking forward to bringing a guest onto the show, and I want to thank Jared from the Monsters and Multiclass podcast for being our first. Jared, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so my name's Jared Bornigal. As you mentioned, I'm with a Dungeons and Dragons podcast, uh, very outside of of this genre. So I'm excited to try podcasting around something else. But that is a, a fifth edition podcast where we discuss the mechanics of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, so if by chance that's something you're interested in, feel free to check it out. Though I don't have much experience with the game itself, I can appreciate your passion for the subject matter and your willingness to share it with the world through podcasting. I have a few friends who would be interested in tuning in for sure. So if you're listening and you want to expand your D&D strategy, check out Jared's podcast. So, Jared, I thought it would be good to start with asking how you became interested in Andrew's music specifically. At what point did you become a fan? Andrew McMahon was actually one of the first musicians I was in any capacity obsessed with uh, and actually like sought out to find new music myself. Um, I'm the youngest of three brothers, so most of my music up until finding it, which was back in fourth grade, was just you know, being given new music from them. I remember I was given the song Hurricane, uh, which I think is off the Audio Boxer album. Yep. Um, and I loved the song, listened to it over and over and over. And I was like telling my brother about it. And he looked at me and he said, if you like it so much, you should go find other music from that artist. And it's just like my world expanded a thousand times in a second. Uh, I started looking for absolutely everything, something corporate related, mainly how I fell in love there. As the one time I met Andrew McMahon, I actually embarrassingly told him uh, that he's the reason I started illegally downloading music, (laughs) Uh, which (laughs) he appreciated. So I guess we're fine, but (laughs) that's great. Yeah. I would, that's really cool that it, it sounds like we have that in common where when you find an artist you enjoy, and you said this is the first time you've done this, but that's that's always been my way. When I have an artist I enjoy, I just dig in completely. I go nuts. I, I go to try to find everything I possibly can. Right. And so like I, I took that mentality with me, like anytime I found an artist I liked and like really liked, just like, you know, dive in, find all the B sides, find uh, unturn every stone until you've got it all. Right. And and yeah, and then when Jack's mannequin came along, it was kinda like Oh, it's the same guy. It's right. and he's still making great music, and <laughs> right. he's just calling it something else. Right. Like I think I heard "Dark Blue" as as you know, always Jack Mannequin's most popular song, and I was like, "Wow, his voice sounds a lot like the guy from Something Corporate." And then you know, boom, there's already two albums out. <laughs> yep. Yeah, well, that's the best when you can go back and say, "Oh my gosh, there's stuff I didn't even know about." Mm-hmm. So is there a specific memory uh, or, or maybe a specific uh, time of your life that you associate with his, his music or, or let's say Jack's Mannequin in particular? Yeah, it feels so juvenile at this point, but like it really was a big portion of my, my middle school to like early high school years. I think Andrew McMahon's music really defined uh, a lot of my high school years because he has such an amazing voice and I spent a lot of my life singing and I was part of choirs and you know everything else I was in a band later in high school and he was very much so like a a vocal role model for me where you know picking up on subtleties that he would use in music with like vocal layering and just the the tonality that he brings uh i'd say that alone was like is a lot of what i associate with jack's mannequin is like it's i used the jack's mannequin discography to create my own vocal sound a lot of years practicing (laughs) that's kind of cool that you were able to apply it as a singer and incorporate that into the way that you did it yeah so have you ever had the opportunity to describe Jack's Mannequin to somebody else that had never heard of them? And and how would you describe them? Uh, man, I always struggled with that. I had many opportunities in my life, you know, of people saying like, oh, what's your favorite band? And, you know, I'd say something corporate, Jack's Mannequin. And I think the, the easiest way I'd always describe it, just like at its basic level, was piano rock. That just sounds awesome. I was like, do you like rock? Yeah. All right. Now add a piano and make that like the center instrument. And and that was about it. If that didn't hook them, then they were hopeless. <laughs> yeah, I would say the same. That's how I described him to my uh, my now wife. 
I took her to a Jack's Mannequin concert in 2008. Well, the Warp Tour, technically. Yeah, it's it's kind of punky, kind of rocky, but he has a piano, so it's different and it's right. really cool. Well, let's let's get to the song that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I have to admit that this song is not one of my favorite Andrew songs of all time, but I really enjoy looking through the whole catalog and finding reasons to talk about each song. And let's face it, he recorded these songs. Every one of these songs means something to Andrew McMahon, so they all warrant a discussion, in my opinion. The line, it started feeling like October, and I haven't been able to get that line out of my head ever since, so. Yeah, it definitely, I mean, it's it's a simplistic lyrically, but it does hold a lot of weight. I feel like autumn as a season specifically uh, has a very strong feeling, uh, and, and just that beginning of October vibes. I don't know. I, I always like that as well. So every time October rolls around, it's, it's in my head. Where other people are saying, you wake me up when September ends, I've got the... Yeah, it started feeling like October. Well, let's go through some stats real quick. So obviously the band that released the song is Jack's Mannequin, and it is track seven from The Glass Passenger, released on September 30th, 2008. It was not released as a single, but I did find out recently that it was released on a promotional single of The Resolution. There's also a live version of it on the deluxe edition of The Glass Passenger. Just some production notes. So the song, along with the rest of the album, was written by Andrew McMahon. Patrick Warren was on the Chamberlain, which is an electromechanical keyboard instrument. C.J. Erickson is back on programming, just like on Everything in Transit. Jonathan Sullivan is on the bass, as well as the upright bass. It's the only song on the record that he plays the upright bass. And lastly, we have some familiar faces, such as Bobby Raw on guitar and Jay McMillan on drums. The song was produced by Jim Wirt and Andrew McMahon, as was the rest of the album. So when you and I first connected, Jared... This song was one of the first ones you mentioned, actually, before I even brought it up. Is there a specific reason, a specific connection you have to this particular song? You know, uh, when I did see your initial question, I just kind of went through and I was like, you know, what are some Jack's Mannequin songs I liked? And it's it's honestly been a bit of an Andrew McMahon drought for me. And and since we've spoken, uh, I've had a bit of a resurgence, uh, just thinking about it more and, and, you know, going back, reminiscing. And... I don't think this song has a specific special place. I love it. So yeah, as I've had time, more time to sit and think about it, I'm not sure if it has like a a specific resonance with me beyond not a, a lyrical standpoint, but the backup vocals that kick in on the second verse, which I don't even know if they're backup vocals, but whatever it's called, just the, the when it's late, don't stop looking where my eyes turn to glass. When it's late, don't stop, Annie, I'll make it back. The way that that said was like just one of those times where every time I would hear it, it would just be like, I have to stop everything and like just focus on that because I just love the way that it comes through. Though the entire song doesn't fall into like my, the higher echelon for Jack's Mannequin, that part is like a top 10 part for me. <laughs> There's other songs that I feel strongly that way about, uh, so I can completely understand that. So I'll go through some live history regarding the song. According to Setlist FM, this song's been played live 78 times total. One of those times was when I saw them in Columbus in 2016 for the 10 Years in Transit tour. The Setlist after they played through everything in transit was kind of surprising to me, actually. I thought some of the songs were unusual choices, like Annie Use Your Telescope and Caves. You know, a little bit slower songs uh, toward the end of the concert, but I think they're fan favorites, and I think that's why they applied. But I was surprised that after they played Transit, they really focused heavily on The Glass Passenger and not at all on um, People and Things, which I was a little bit disappointed in. Have you ever seen this song perform live? I have not, and I had to look through Setlist FM to make sure that, you know, of, of the times I've seen them, which probably around a dozen now, uh, not a single one did they play Annie Use Your Telescope. Uh, but I looked up a couple live versions, and I guess a I was jealous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a obviously a ballad. It's a little bit slower, but I think it's a good break between a lot of the the what, you know, what you might call a banger right. in the middle, you know, in the set. So, there's a lot of emotion attached to the song uh, for Andrew, which I, I know we'll explore a little bit more here in a bit. So, I think I think that's why he he plays it as often as he does. All right, so the most recent time this has been played was actually on May 5th in his Instagram live stream. And he had a lot to say about the song from a songwriting perspective. Did you did you catch that live stream? Yes, yeah, I did. Okay. There's something he says when he's introducing that song, and I thought it was really interesting. And it may have more to do with the times that we're in, the, you know, the year 2020, rather than the song itself. But he said, 
sometimes we're a little lost in space in the middle of this craziness. And then he went into the song. Do you have any thoughts about what, what he meant there in relation to the song itself? Yeah, the, the song itself uses travel very heavily, as well as a lot of songs by Andrew McMahon uses travel as a an allegory to express deeper feelings. Um, and I think Annie Use Your Telescope is on a literal level talking about the idea of touring and, and being disconnected from other people from a, again, physical location standpoint. Uh, but I think if you if you give it a, a deeper thought, it's really, really just talking about that idea of, of feeling separated from other people from a, a point of understanding, you know, like really just going through different things at different times and, and being unable to uh, feel like you're you're on the same page uh, with, I believe, specifically his wife. And, and this comes off the time that they had gotten back together after a big breakup. It said a lot about how, you know, even when we're having those moments of, of disconnect from each other, you know, use your telescope, meaning like, look past what you can see normally and realize that, yeah, I'm still right here uh, we can still be connected even if we're having those moments of disconnect. And I think we're all feeling that right now or need to feel that right now. Absolutely. It's the time of our lives right now. We're all looking for a connection. I like that you brought up their relationship because, yeah, they were they were broken up and they were just getting back together. They had moved into this house at, uh, on Silver Lake, the house with the green roof. And the way he said it on Instagram made me feel like I should know I should know that place he, as a hardcore fan. He said that in the song, um, oh, it's off of the first Andrew Man in the Wilderness record. Maps for the Getaway. If you remember that song, there's the green roof in that. Yeah, I think you're right. He was just referencing, he said, you remember the house with the green roof, the one that was mentioned in this other song. So, okay, I, I love that song. That one means a lot to me. But he also went on to say that this house was the first time they could have a grand piano in one of their homes, So, which was really significant because he was experiencing writer's block at the time while writing The Glass Passenger. You know, he had gone through his diagnosis of acute lymphoblastic leukemia and then his treatment, his subsequent treatment afterward. And then he was on tour for a long time. So he was just exhausted. He was having trouble writing. And this is the song that broke his writer's block, according to Andrew. I I think that's why the song means so much to him. Not only did it break his writer's block, but as you mentioned, it's right. about his wife and uh, the disconnect they may have been feeling and just just reconnecting, just kind of coming back together. I know the majority of the songs for The Glass Passenger were written in mid to late t- 2007. So I assume that living in the house with a green roof on Silver Lake was during that time. Right. And, you know, that uh, that first opening line of it started feeling like October, it almost seems like a the type of lyric that breaks a, a writer's block uh, just because it is so simplistic yet evocative uh, that, you know, it's just like you're just sitting there. It's just like I got to put something down. It starts feeling like October. Like it's just, you know, literally just observing the world around you. Absolutely simple, but effective. Right. 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 Yeah. It especially the way he sings it. And that's something I've always enjoyed about Andrew's music is when he sings something, you can tell he means it. He knows how to put emphasis on the the right phrases. Yep. Uh, So let's talk about the sound of the song, if you will. It's mostly based around the piano. It definitely feels to me like a solo Andrew song. It it almost feels orchestral to me, the way it, and I I think it has to do with those uh, layering of the vocals that you mentioned earlier. Right. That just kind of blend in with with the the music itself. And I, I really appreciate that. And as you mentioned, there's the it's the only song with an upright bass, so like it it is a little more orchestral. But I have to say that um, the Glass Passenger, in my opinion, is the most diverse record of everything Andrew's ever released. There's so many different sounds on that record. There's so many different styles. And I have to point out where this song "Annie Use Your Telescope" falls in the track list. It's after "Suicide Blonde" and before "Bloodshot," which are completely different sounding songs than any user telescope. Yeah, I mean, even just the the three of them, I feel like all together, I mean, Bloodshot to me is always one of the more harder Andrew McMahon songs uh, in a style that I, I don't think we've normally seen out of him. Suicide Blonde, that seems a little more like what you'd expect. But regardless, you're right, that's like sandwiched in between just very different styles. Yeah. Which like you mentioned earlier with like live, it's used as kind of a break from those more high energy songs. I would assume that was intentional. Absolutely. So it, it sounds like he used it the same way on the on the record as he does in live shows. 
Annie, Use Your Telescope, was initially a a two-and-a-half-minute song when it was written, but Jim Wirt, the producer, encouraged Andrew to expand on it. It kind of makes me wonder about part of the song. There's this part of the song around the minute-and-a-half mark, and it sounds different from the rest of the song, which really relates to what we were just talking about with the album as a whole. I just feel like there's, there's something in the middle of the song that felt added later on, and I could be way off, but he says in the line, it's, it's, it's where he says, hello, is there anybody out there? Right. And it, it just feels different than anything else in the song. And then, hello, I'm only getting farther. And then he goes back into, it started feeling like October. It kind of feels like the start of the song again. Right. And it basically just goes from there into the chorus and it kind of repeats in different ways. Huh. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I'm curious if that's where it was extended. I know that the the hardest part of writing a song is usually the bridge. So normally, I actually find that Andrew McMahon writes astoundingly good bridges. I would say this is one of the weaker ones. It does seem to come out of nowhere. And it now that you, like you're mentioning it, it feels almost like it's padding for time. That's what I thought. And I could be wrong. And you know, if you were to ask the songwriter himself, he might say, "Yeah, that's that's that was the most significant part for me." But uh, it it just felt like uh, like something extra thrown in there. So I found an article from the Alternative Press in 2009, and the author referenced the Beach Boys. She says, "Highlight Annie Use Your Telescope borrows more from that band's pet sounds and is a creative departure for McMahon. Somber and expansive, it unfurls like a slow motion flower bloom." thanks to harmonies treated with echoing reverb, swirling chords, and midnight-hued percussion. Coincidentally, that article was written by a woman named Annie. <laughs> yeah. So, but, it, but I do love the colorful language that Annie uses to describe yeah. the song. I would have never been able to describe it that way, but it's just beautiful the way she describes it. Yeah. Props to you, Annie. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about the lyrics then. Um, I did notice that there's only 15 unique lines in the entire song. Yeah, yeah, definitely one of the less lyrically dense songs. Do you feel like it's an incomplete story, or is everything there that he was trying to tell? That's more how I feel. I mean, it, it's impossible to remove that writer's block lens now that I've you know, seen it and heard it, but having that type of simplistic but just solid song is more important than putting together something that is more lyrically dense. To me, it reads like a quick but meaningful love note. And those don't always need to be extremely long. I really like that. It's it's a love note to Kelly. Right. What a perfect way to describe it. One of the prime lines in the entire song to me was, they made my life into a movie as if I could forget those years. I saw Dear Jack, the documentary film about his diagnosis and treatment, many years ago, and I went back and rewatched it recently. That film holds so much more weight for me now because he's very open about his life through his songs. When I watched it recently, it just felt that much more emotional. Like I was watching somebody that I know a lot about his life go through this, and it was it was absolutely heart-wrenching. Have you seen the film? I, I have seen the film. I saw it when it originally released, and I actually just rewatched it this morning. I think it came out in 2009, so yep. over a decade now. So yeah, but the the lines themselves, it uh, I don't I don't know exactly what message he's trying to get across there in the the sense of the as if I could forget those years. Of course, they were very meaningful years. Like they're just a difficult time for him. To some extent, it almost comes across to me like it could be a a bitterness towards the documentation of that time. And I wonder, more so at the time of of writing this than I would assume now, if there was a little bit of of heartache from having that just so public. I mean, that's like a really dark time of his life, as he said many times, the hardest part of his life. Uh, and now it's just being put into a hour long film. So I just I do wonder how how that affected the uh, I guess the phrasing of that lyric. And I know he shot a lot of that video himself or had Kelly shoot it on a handheld camcorder. And I I couldn't help but wonder while watching the film, was he shooting it with the the foresight to show it to people later on to to think to record all of that? And it's amazing how much he had recorded. And I assume it was his idea to share that out as a film to to create awareness. Yeah, to create the awareness, because shortly after that, he created the Dear Jack Foundation. Right. 
you know, if for anybody listening who's uh, interested, if you go to DearJackFoundation.org, you can find out how you can get involved in fundraising. There's actually a benefit concert he puts on most every November, although this year's in question. I don't know how he's going to pull that off this year, if it's going to be a virtual event. Uh, we're only a month out, and I have not heard about it. But that's an event I've always wanted to attend, and I've never yet had the possibility. Well, maybe next year. Uh <laughs> But it still, it does very much so make me think about where he says, so they made my life into a movie. That's what makes me just wonder, like, how much of it, not so much was it his decision, because obviously he got the the final say on that, but just a curiosity, something I'd like to ask him at least. Yeah, and maybe it's in the editing. You got to wonder, he probably had so much more footage that wasn't shown, and so maybe it's whomever edited it. They made my life into a movie. Like you said, you brought up a great point. They cut it down to an hour and eight minutes of the most significant event of his entire life. Right. But the way I interpret that second part of the line is if I could forget those years, I don't know if it's a bitterness as much of a sometimes I don't want to remember that. Sometimes I don't want to think about that, especially when it was so close to the present moment. I don't want to think about that time in my life, but there's this movie and everybody's talking to me about it. I don't need a movie to remind me how horrible that was. Exactly, exactly. And even though, you know, he he could have been the one to say, like, yes, we should document this. We should do this for awareness. You're trying to move on. You know, that was just something you want to put behind you. But you want to raise awareness. You want to put this out in front of people. You want people to see what it looks like. Well, that means you have to relive it yourself a little bit, too. And, and that's tough. I have to assume that there's more positive to come out of that than negative because they raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to help people going through treatment for cancer every year. You know, it, it, it's the case of a musician who has a voice, has a platform, and he's been able to use it for good to combat something that he had a negative experience with, but he's going to turn it into a positive. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, when, as I said, I, I found them when I was in my, my formative years, my teenage years, and it was really important to me that he was kind of my role model because he was a musician who was doing something positive with his platform. And that that really said, that spoke a lot to me and informed me of the, the person I would want to be given I was in any type of position like that. Heck, even small things with the, the podcast I have now as whatever size fan base it has, just keeping that in the back of my head, like, hey, you know, when you have the power to do something, it's it's better to do it than to not and just sit back. Right. So I've always really respected him for that. And I'm sure he'd appreciate hearing that, that he, he has inspired somebody else to use, use their voice and their platform uh, to help others. That's, that's amazing. We know that the song, Annie Use Your Telescope, is about his wife. You know, he's mentioned it several times. You know, her middle name is Anne, so Kellyanne. I like this quote that he said about the song. I knew I was going to find my way back to solid ground, but it was so clear I wasn't there yet. I willed that telescope into her hands to keep an eye on me and make sure I got home safely. So I assume he was out on tour, he needed a break, he had to come home, and she was the one that kind of kept him grounded, kept him, kept him on that solid ground and uh, made him feel safe, you know, because that's, that's, what, that's what relationships do for a lot of us. Um, I myself am married, and, uh, and we do. We look to our significant others sometimes to help us feel grounded, help us feel safe, help, help us feel normal, especially in tumultuous times. You know, like uh, I could use the recent example of, of the pandemic in 2020, but in his case, it was having so much happening in, in his professional life and personal life all kind of converging at once, uh, some positive, some negative. And just trying to sort all that out. And, you know, I, I get the a strong feeling, and maybe I'm assuming something when I shouldn't, uh, that a lot of feelings from, uh, I guess, when everything in transit released, which is around the time of him being diagnosed, uh, I feel like this song pulls from the, a lot of those emotions. And as I understand, that's when they separated. And a lot of that was because, you know, regardless of, of the leukemia, it was just... There was a lot going on with something corporate kind of getting bigger and and trying to figure out, like, where do I go from here? You know, it's it's very easy to just feel lost. And I I love the way you say that. We're just a lot of times looking to Kelly for that for that grounding. Yeah. All right. So if you haven't seen that film, Dear Jack, I definitely recommend checking it out. It's fifteen dollars at DearJackFoundation.org. So there is a deluxe edition of The Glass Passenger available out on Spotify. I'd recommend checking that out as well. It includes a live version of Annie User Telescope. 
I thought it was great because it reminded me of the time that I was able to see that live in concert. And I like how he introduces it. And it's kind of going back to what we were talking about with Kellyanne. He says, this one is about my girl and her telescope. And he launches into the song. <laughs> yeah. Like, I just thought it was so funny how he said that. <laughs> so, um, yeah. That's great. Uh, another cool version I found out there is uh, BuzzNet has an acoustic version out on YouTube. You can get it where it's just Bobby and Andrew, just an acoustic guitar, a piano, and the vocals. Bobby's doing backup vocals. It is an excellent recording. It's very high quality. I would highly recommend checking out that BuzzNet video, and I will put that link in the show notes for you. Fun fact, Jared, did you know that there's an Annie Use Your Telescope font out there? No, I did not. I didn't know fonts were named after songs, but when I Googled Annie Use Your Telescope, which is kind of where I start the research for each one of these songs, and I found out that Annie Use Your Telescope is a font designed by Kimberly Guesswine, and it was based on the writing of one of her photography students, and the student was a huge Jack's Mannequin fan, so she let her name it. Awesome. Yeah, it's it's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, I'll link that in the show notes as well, so you all can find it out there. Where does this song rank for you in the catalog? Is it near the top? Is it right in the middle? Just Jack's Mannequin, let's say. Where does it rank for you in the Jack's catalog? I, I put it somewhere in the middle. It's, uh, you know, a, a big C of middle. <laughs> I'd have to agree with you there. I'd, I'd put it right in the middle. It's uh, When it comes on, it's like, oh, this is a good song. But it's not usually one that I would go to Spotify or grab my CD and put on specifically. Right. I'm like trying to think of like so, like a song that falls on the lower tier just to like use as a barometer. But none are really coming to mind. Yeah, say it, that's the hardest one. It's like if you ask me, well, what would be the bottom five? Well, I don't. I have no idea. I mean, I feel like there's the, the top 10 or 20. And then there's the middle, you know, like, I don't know if there's a bottom. Yeah, I, I hate to say it. I know there would be like one or two songs off of people and things. I know it would. I, I love the album, but there was a couple that just didn't, they didn't stick with me. I got to say, I like Annie Use Your Telescope more after listening to it repeatedly from different <laughs> versions, really digging in. But I think that's just natural. Yeah. Uh, you're either going to get, you're either going to get sick of a song or you're going to enjoy it more after hearing it over and over again. I guess that's what uh, the intention of pop music is on the radio, you know, when they play it over and over again. So it, it it is effective. Right. But I discovered recently that there are several songs on The Glass Passenger that I probably didn't give enough credit to back when it came out. Not surprisingly, they're mostly the slower songs on the record. But I got to say, I've opened up a bit more to them recently, and Annie Use Your Telescope is one of those. That's funny. I feel like I've always felt kind of the the opposite way for the glass passenger where like the more upbeat ones, those ones never really did anything for me. Whereas like all of the like slower ballad ones like that is all about those. <laughs> yeah. I think at that point I was also looking for things that reminded me of everything in transit, but probably still looking for things that reminded me of something corporate. Yeah. That makes sense. Do you have any final thoughts on the song itself? Just once again, that I absolutely love that the final, like, minute of that song uh and and hearing it live he when he does like the the whoa, whoa, whoa he always like he puts a really weird tone on it at the end that i i absolutely love he seems to get like really really into uh that final part there yeah another example of, of how when he sings something you can feel it right exactly i love that i absolutely love it uh, well, thank you so much, Jared, for being on the show with us today. I love what you had to say because you brought things to the table that I didn't think of. So I, I appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, no problem. And let me know when you do Doris Day because that song, that's that's a number five right there. <laughs> oh, that's top five. Huh? Oh, yeah. Doris Day. That's a banger. Thank you guys for listening. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast so more people can find it. Post a comment on one of our socials. I'd love to hear your feedback. If you'd like to message me directly, email somethinginthewilderness at gmail.com. And again, thank you, Jared, for coming on the show to discuss this song with me. And if you guys out there want to hear what Jared is up to in his regular podcast, don't forget to check out Monsters and Multiclass. If you want to follow in Jared's footsteps and guest on the show, let me know. Until next time, try to keep an eye on one another, even if it's from afar. <laughs>